Well, this morning we're going to be continuing through Matthew 7. And uh, I'd like to just pray for us before we turn to our scripture this morning. Father, I thank you for your goodness and your mercy in our lives. I thank you for all of your provisions and blessings. I thank you that you've gathered us here this morning as your people, that we could have this time set aside to, to sing praise to you, Father, to thank you for who you are, to focus on all that you do for us every moment. Father, as we come to, to your scripture, Father, I pray that you would, would open up our hearts and our minds, that you'd allow for us to hear, to see, to, to understand, Father, that these words would take root in our hearts, Father, that you would draw us all closer to you. Thank you in our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to start by reading our whole text together, since it's only six verses instead of three chapters. So from beginning to end, verse 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who, to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, this passage is about prayer, that's true, but we also must not jump to conclusions too quickly. We must keep in mind the context in which we arrive at this passage, this paragraph. Jesus has been talking about our relationship with other people, right? Verses 1 through 6 talked about not being critical to others, instead seeking to be helpful to do those things that build up instead of tear down, to bring people what they need, such as the gospel, rather than things they don't need, like a debate. And there's no reason to imagine that Jesus is jumping from speaking of our relationship with other people to, in verse 7, speaking to addressing God. With that, as you may have seen in verse 11, Jesus will also eventually get to speaking to what we receive from God when we ask. And so in this way, this passage is about both our relationship with one another, with other people, and our relationship with God. Which should not be surprising to us, for we know that the two things certainly go together, that they must be in agreement in our lives. 1 John 4, 8 makes this point. It says, Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And in 1 John 4.20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And so we're going to start with the context here about our relationship with other people. The principle of asking as it concerns each other. So let's read verses 7 and 8. It says, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened. And so again, back to our context, Jesus is addressing how we are not to judge others, to not criticize. When we criticize others, we are admittedly not making very many requests. There's not a lot of asking there. There's a lot more demanding when we're being critical. Maybe we could think about our confrontations with others in recent memory, not to suggest that you've had any recently. We can think about, maybe it was someone who didn't do something that they were supposed to do, and you criticized them. You let them know that they always, always, it's always, always, right? Whenever there's a conflict, you always, do such and such. You never do this or that. And you demanded that they change, that they make it right, that they don't do or that they fail to do that what they're supposed to do. 
Wherever the conflict and however we handled it, admittedly the farthest thing from our mind at the time was asking, simply requesting. The truth of the matter is that we do not like to ask people for things for multiple reasons. I think one of the biggest reasons is that there are two possible answers whenever we ask for something and we only like one of them. Asking someone for anything recognizes that they are completely capable of saying no. That's why we have this saying that it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission, right? Because if I ask for permission, it may not be given and then I'd have to live with that. And so instead, I just won't ask and then I can do whatever I want and if someone doesn't like it, we can figure that out later. The request shows weakness, demanding, pretends to be strong, attempts to overpower the other. And so Jesus teaches us that instead of judging and being demanding and critical, we can ask. We can ask them to change, recognizing that change is up to them, that we cannot force it upon them. Second, we are to seek it says. What do we seek in the context of the other? We seek their well-being. We don't criticize, control, or tear down, but we seek to build them up, to strengthen, to encourage one another. Now there's a difference between wanting what is best for someone and actually seeking what is best for them, isn't there? To actually committing to whatever it takes to actually loving and sacrificing for one another. The last time we saw the word seek was when Jesus instructed his followers to seek first the kingdom. And the week before that, we saw Jesus teach us to pray for God's kingdom to come, for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what we are to seek. We seek it for ourselves and we seek it for those around us. As we put others first, as we love them and serve them, as we seek their edification, their maturity in Christ. And third, we are to knock. Now a knock is another kind of request. It's in some ways synonymous with asking, but it noticeably requires even more intentionality. For you can stand at someone's front door and wait for them to happen to open the door and scare them, as you've been a creep on their front porch for who knows how long, And then ask them the question that you've come to ask them. Or you can be intentional and knock on the door. A knock requires assertiveness. You have to walk up to the door and knock. We cannot knock from our comfort zones. When we think about knocking in this way, it is both bold and humble. We are bold enough to make the request that the other would invite us inside, but humble enough to realize that the person doesn't need to open the door and certainly doesn't need to allow us inside. When we knock in this regard with our brothers and sisters, we make ourselves available to one another. We explain that we would like to, to show our love, to support them, to encourage them, to help them on their journey of discipleship. But we recognize that it's a request, that we must leave the keys in their hands, that they are the ones who must make decisions, that they're in control of their lives. We can't change them. We can only walk with them. And so we are humble, we are willing, and we are available. And so we knock, and we see if that person would let us walk with them through whatever it is that we could have instead judged them about that we could have condemned them as good for nothing. Instead, we ask that they would consider change, and we seek their well-being, and we knock. We make ourselves available to help. This is the way we interact as brothers and sisters, the way that we treat one another. In this way, these verses provide sort of the positive instruction to last week's text. Last week spent a lot of time telling us what not to do. Do not judge. But these verses tell us what to do, how to treat one another. Ask, seek, and knock. 
Jesus gives examples of asking, starting in verse 9, which I want to reread. It says, In which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Here Jesus has two specific examples from real life situations of requests being made and answered. Now there are examples found, I can tell you, a hundred times a day of this in any household with children. As children are constantly asking for a snack, especially if you've recently gone to the store. Here the child approaches the father and asks for a loaf of bread. Jesus asks, in that situation, what kind of dad would give the child a stone instead? A stone and a loaf of bread, they could be the same size, they could be the same shape. That's pretty much where all the possible similarities stop, though. A stone cannot be bit into, let alone eaten. A stone is useless to a hungry stomach, while bread nourishes and fills a hungry stomach. No dad would give his child a stone when he asks for a loaf. And the second example follows the first. This time the child asks for a fish, and Jesus asks who would give such a child a serpent. Now both have scales, but one is a staple to Jesus' listeners' diet, and the other is a potentially dangerous and harmful thing. This is the way that asking works. While a parent may say no for some reason, we have to, right? They may be unable to provide bread or fish, especially at that particular moment when the child has decided they are starving. But no parent would give their child the harmful opposite. And really, even outside of the parent-child relationship, no person gives the harmful opposite to something we ask for, right? Any exception there proves the rule, as such a person would be widely regarded as cruel, to say the least. Someone who would give you something harmful when you ask for something good. Generally speaking, when we make a request, we tend to receive what we ask for. Right now, obviously, I'm ignoring the sort of silly and outrageous requests that we can sometimes make, right? Like asking someone for a million dollars. That one's not going to get a yes, at least with anyone I know. If you know someone, I'd like an introduction. But if we don't consider those times when requests cannot be met for some limitation in this fallen and broken world, in general, there is a sort of power behind a request that often makes us feel inclined to say yes. Although we're not required to, hopefully we're able to say no, at least on occasion. That's good for us. But there's an inclination to say yes, to answer requests. Sometimes requests don't even need to be spoken, right? Like if any of you has a family pet, that dog's staring at you while you're trying to eat your dinner, they don't say a word. But the request is clear. It can be hard to say no. Verse 11 is the only verse in this passage that specifically speaks to God and to how this all relates to our relationship with him. These words of Jesus invite us to reconsider this entire passage in a new light. And we're going to do that, but first we're going to kind of skip 11 and go to 12, if you'll bear with me. A verse that again shows us that Jesus is very clearly speaking concerned about our relationship with one another in this passage verse 12 says so whatever you wish that others would do to you do also to them for this is the law and the prophets here jesus sums up everything that has been said truly from the whole sermon on the mount and especially from this idea of making requests instead of condemnations It's all summed up in this so-called golden rule that we would do to others what we wish they would do to us. This is a simple principle. Many of us were probably taught this as children. In fact, this was my daughter's memory verse at school just two weeks ago. Except it was Luke 6.31, which 
is weird because everyone knows Matthew's better than Luke, but that's okay. But if we can put aside how cute this verse kind of is, golden, calling it the golden rule and everything, and if we could consider how radically different our lives would be if we were able to take this to heart, right? If we were able to follow this simple verse, so simple that a hundred kindergartners could memorize it just down the street from here. It's a simple thing. While we would still have conflicts, it is to some degree unavoidable in our sinful and broken world. But so many of our problems, our conflicts, our headaches, our heartaches, and so forth, so many of them would be completely different, maybe completely avoided, if we treated other people the way that we want them to treat us. And of course, if other people treated us the same, Now, I think about when I have to go to the DMV or when I have to talk to somebody who who has people speaking disrespectfully to them, complaining to them all day long. That is their job, to sit there and have people complain to them. Now, these people have a reputation for being grumpy and unhelpful, to say the least, right? Anybody? No one works at the DMV, right? I hope not. And I I always try, though, when I go or have to speak to someone in such situations, I always try to see if I can be so nice and so appreciative and so kind that by the end of our interaction, I've turned them pleasant. That's how I win going to the DMV. And almost every time I find that they are, that they become pleasant. Because in most cases, I believe that they they don't want to be unhelpful. That's not, they didn't wake up and think, I want to be unhelpful and ruin people's day today. This is going to be great. Maybe some of them, but I think that that's not true for most of them. I think that they want to be able to fulfill our request, that there are just certain rules that they have to follow, that there's certain paperwork and payments that you have to have and make for them to be able to say yes to your request. But if we would treat them how we want them to treat us, They tend to treat us the same way in return. Now moving from those occasional sort of interactions, though, to our everyday interactions, we could consider how different would our lives look if you responded to your spouse, your co-workers, your children, your neighbors, and so on, the way that you would want them to respond to you. Next time a situation arises, Ask yourself, how would I have wanted them to respond? Would I have wanted them to respond this way if I was on their side of the equation and they were on mine? We can, through the grace of God, develop a certain reflex concerning this. A reflex that right before we act in any way, we could pause and ask ourselves if we would want that person to act in that way toward us. Consider how many times this would keep us from doing and saying something that we would later regret. This is a reflex that God can develop within us. It's also one that we can ask God for. And with that, we finally consider the way of making requests to God concerning our own needs and desires. In verse 11, when Jesus speaks of asking our Father in heaven and the good things that he gives... He causes us to reconsider, to go back and reread the entire passage in that regard as well. For all the things that we started thinking about in regard to other people, we now see concerns God as well. That they are more true of our relationship with God than they are of our relationships with each other. And so going back to the beginning, we must first ask If we want something, we have to ask for it. Now, this is a much bigger subject than we have time for this morning, so I'm just going to make a simple statement, and we're going to have to keep working on it, keep going with it. And that is that our prayers make a difference, right? We must understand that our prayers make a difference. There's no other reason for Jesus to tell us to pray, to ask if our prayers do not make a difference. Yes, God knows our needs, We saw in Matthew 6 that he knows our needs before we even ask for them. But like every other relationship, we are to ask. 
We have a lot of ways that I think we can misunderstand all of this. I think it's important that we understand that God is not merely waiting for us to ask. That God is not saying, well, jump through the hoop of praying and then I'll deal with what you want. Then I'll bless you. Nor is, God, nor is praying for something a second time evidence that we didn't have faith when we asked it the first time. Right? None of this is, these are things that we can think and that people think, but none of this is the picture that Jesus draws for us here. Rather, Jesus describes God like this. He says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Jesus says that if in our brokenness we know how to give good things, to our children, how much more does God? Or rather, the best parent in the world, whatever that even means, the best parent in the world pales in comparison to the goodness of God. The best example we can think of, whomever it is that we know or we've read about, that we consider to be good, generous, kind, and so forth, those characteristics come from God and are just a tiny, blurry reflection of how good, kind, and generous God is. Now, in many ways, this verse is attached to what's become, it's perhaps one of the most important verses to me over time. This verse is at the center of my understanding of who God is, of my relationship with God, of everything I strive to do and be. And the reason for that is quite simply because our, our understanding of God is everything. It makes or breaks our relationship with God. If we misunderstand God, then our relationship with God will follow course. How we see God, how we see God relating to and interacting with us is at the core of how we handle every situation in our lives, every interaction with each other, and how we approach each day. And I find that sometimes even things that are true about God can keep us from what God has for us. For example, we know that God knows our thoughts. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. An amazing thing. What a comforting thought. That God knows our deepest thoughts, our darkest thoughts. Thoughts that we wouldn't want to share with anyone, and yet He still loves us. He knew those thoughts before He started the relationship with us in the first place. How comforting that is. But we can easily allow that the truth that God already knows to keep us from pursuing intimacy with God. For if God already knows, then why do we need to pray? Why do we need to walk with God? This is never God's intention. Never God's desire. Jesus went to the cross to restore our relationship. The veil that separated us from God was torn in two. God would not be kept in a temple away from us, but he came to us, right into the midst of our brokenness, and he continues to walk with us. And so we can't allow truths like God's omniscience to keep us from a relationship with God, right? My wife cannot read my, my, cannot read my mind, right? She may try at times. It's probably harder than it even seems, I'll admit. But in order for her to know my thoughts and my feelings, I have to say them. I have to actually share them with her. Our limitations as humans allow for us, because we're not able to read one another's mind, to grow in intimacy, those limitations allow us to grow closer into a deeper relationship. If we were able to read one another's minds, we could simply exist together. We could simply go about what it is that we have before us and never speak, for I would know exactly what's going on in her mind without ever speaking to her. Our limitations draw us closer, but we can allow the truth that God knows everything to keep us from walking with him, from sharing everything with him. Or we can take God's omnipotence. God is all-powerful. What an awesome truth. But how many headaches 
trying to figure out how such and such is the way it is if God's all-powerful, right? Those are just the ancient sort of theological questions. Why such a terrible thing has happened on God's watch since he's all-powerful? It's easy for us to recognize that as people we have limits. We only have so much time, so much energy, so many resources. And so sometimes we're unable to help whatever the cause but we struggle to understand how our limitless God can fail to act in the way that we desire. These are the burning questions whenever someone suffers, aren't they? Especially in tragic ways. And we ask why. If God is able, why didn't he? And I'm not going to gloss over that suffering. It is real and it is painful and it is difficult. What I merely want to say is that if our starting point is these things, that God is all-powerful, that God is all-knowing, I think that we are liable to paint ourselves into a corner at some point. And I have found that the starting point that Jesus gives us concerning God is time and time again, and the starting point that I find helps me to finish the race marked out before me, the starting point is that God is good. He is our good Father. Whatever is going on, whatever it is that we are trying to figure out, this one thing we know, God is good. These words of Jesus are the foundation that allow for us to stand in the midst of any storm. God is good, and he gives good things. James writes that every good and perfect gift comes from God. That is who he is. And rather mysteriously, it seems that those who have suffered the most are those who are most certain of God, more certain than those who haven't. We can rest in this. God is a good father who will give good things to his children. And so we must ask for those things, those good things. And we can do so confidently. For he will not give us a stone or a snake, Jesus says here. For not even a bad earthly father would do that. We can trust that he will always give us the best. And so we can be confident that he will always give us the good thing. If we ask for a loaf of bread or a fish, he will not give us a stone or a snake. We can also be confident, though, that if we ask for a stone or a snake, he won't give it to us, right? For sometimes, we don't realize it at the time, but sometimes we ask for a bad thing. Sometimes we're liable to pray for something harmful, even dangerous in our lives. We may think that it's a good thing. We may think that we are asking for a loaf of bread, but we are asking for a viper. Good parents do not give their children a harmful thing because they asked for it. A parent discerns what is best for the child. If the child asks for a snake, a parent will give a child a fish. The same is true of God, more true of God, for he has no limitations, no brokenness that we have as parents. And so it's my hope that this would draw us into a deeper union, a deeper intimacy with our good Father. We have no reason not to be. He welcomes us. He's not too busy for us. Rather, he is constantly pursuing us, inviting us, drawing us to him. We can have so many other pictures of God, but this is how Jesus describes him to us time and time again. He is our good father. Not only does our good father invite us to ask, but to seek as well. He assures us that when we seek, we will find. Now, if you remember in Matthew 6, 33, Jesus told his followers to seek first the kingdom. Sounded like a difficult thing. What does that mean? Now we see that we will find what we seek. There's no trick here. Jesus doesn't tell us to look for something that we can't find. The kingdom is available to us. We'll seek that which we find. And the kingdom is the place where God's will is done. When we seek God's will in our life, we'll find it. That also means, though, that we pursue that which we've asked for, 
right? We don't pray and sit on the couch, binging Netflix, waiting for God to answer our prayers. But we pursue it. We pursue that which we've asked for, moving forward, trusting that God will open the doors as appropriate, that he will make the way for us for whatever good thing he's going to bless us with. Not only do we ask and seek, but we also knock. We make the request to come inside, to dwell with God, for God to dwell with us. We do not merely ask for God to provide what we want, but what we truly want, what we truly need is God himself and living in an intimate, constant relationship with him. The ultimate good thing for God to give us is God himself. His presence, his goodness, his mercy, his grace to strengthen us, his fullness and joy, his love and kindness, all of who he is. That is the good thing that Christ died to restore. Restore to us. It didn't go anywhere. We did. Let us not take that for granted, though. Let us not ignore it, but let us pursue it. Let us seek a deeper understanding, a deeper experience of it. Now, I really learned so much from my children. It's kind of ironic. Any parents would probably agree with me. I'm trying to teach them, but in the process, they teach me about myself, about life, and even about God. And I think of when Jesus tells us to be like little children. And I think that part of that is in this regard. The example my children set for me in approaching our Father in heaven, in asking, seeking, and knocking. For over time, I've become convinced that there's absolutely nothing that will keep my children from asking me for something even if sometimes I wish there were. I'm sometimes shocked at their nerve, to be honest. They could get in trouble for not, for not listening. Whatever they've done, they can get in trouble, and the very next minute, maybe not even a whole minute, be asking for a snack or a surprise or something else. When we go to the store, they aren't thinking, well, I was blessed with such and such last time I was here. They may not even be thinking, I got something at the store that we just left before we drove across the street to this one. They're not even deterred by a series of no's from previous requests. Well, he said no the last five times, so maybe I won't ask the six. No, the no's seem to encourage them. They aren't afraid. What will dad think if I ask for this toy? And they're not wondering if they're good enough to ask. For something. But so many of these sort of thoughts get in our way with our good Father. We know that we're liable to think of God as a genie who gives us whatever we want, and we don't want to think that way. And so, more likely than that, we don't want to think of God as a genie, so let's not ask for anything. Let's not come to Him in prayer. So instead, we don't bring whatever it is before Him. Or we think we don't deserve it, and so we don't talk about it with God. Or some kind of hard situation arises in our life, and we think, well, I probably deserve this. And so we grit our teeth and we endure it. Whatever the picture, whatever the situation is in our lives, I want us to remember that He is our Father and He is good. And He so desires for us to come to Him, to come to him with our needs, with our wants, with our struggles, with our questions, whatever it is. He wants us to speak our mind with him. Now we will sometimes have the wrong idea, maybe more times than not. We'll sometimes think that we're being given a bad thing that's really a good thing, or that we're being denied a good thing that is really a bad thing. We lack understanding in so many ways, but God will show us that in time. Right, Just as a, uh, my kids may struggle to understand why they can't have ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. right? That is a bad thing that they think is a good thing. But a parent has to slowly explain these things to a child. Teach them step by step. And so God will work with us lovingly and patiently teaching us step by step. 
Showing us the good things that are actually bad things and the bad things that are actually good things. Showing us which way's up and which way's down. And so it's my prayer that each of us would come to see the goodness of God clearly. That would be the starting point and the ending point for every avenue of our lives. To see how he loves us. He is a loving father. He is so much better than we can imagine. He is faithful even when we're faithless. He is generous and kind even when we're disobedient. And he is patient even on our most stubborn days. I'm not excusing any of those things, but rather I say that to remind us that they are not excuses to keep us from God. He calls us to him, to walk with him, to talk with him, to share every burden with him. And so let us, as his children, ask. Today, ask God to show you his goodness in your life more clearly. Ask God to show you that he is a good father, And then seek it with your whole heart. Knock and accept the invitation to deeper intimacy with our good Father. Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, Father, thank you. Well, I just said over 4,000 words and they don't even grace, don't even grace the surface of who you are. They don't even touch your goodness in our lives, Father. And I just pray, I ask, I thank you that we can ask, and I ask that you would show us your goodness clearly, Father. That you would show us how much you love us. That you are our Father in heaven who gives good things, that every good and perfect thing comes from you. Father, whatever it is that we're going through, whatever our questions, our struggles, whether we're going through the best of times or the worst, Father, we know that you are good and you are with us. Father, I pray that you would help us to see that clearly, to lean into it, Father. I thank you that you are walking with us, that like a loving Father, you are patient even when we throw a tantrum thinking you have denied us a good thing, throw a tantrum thinking you've punished us, Father. Help us to see clearly the work you're doing in our lives as we take confidence knowing that our good, good Father will not stop the work he started until it's complete, Father. Continue to work in our hearts and lives. We thank you and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.